So you guys saw the Goblin King in this movie? I'm really wondering who the animator was who slipped that design in without anyone realizing it. Cause I mean seriously, just look at that chin. The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. So The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey came out last year, it was opening up to huge amounts of hype. And this is a prequel to the Lord of the Rings trilogy and it mainly focuses on Bilbo Baggins. We see Bilbo's adventures with the dwarves, how he got a hold of the ring, all of that. And to be clear also, this is The Hobbit in 24 frames a second. I've never seen it in 48 frames. So this movie starts off again with a big flashback like all the other movies do. It sets up the story of Erebor and how Smaug went and took over everything. And now it cuts back to the modern day Shire, which this part's kind of a mixed bag for me. Because you see Ian Holm and he played old Bilbo in The Fellowship of the Ring. But he doesn't look the same as he did in Fellowship of the Ring. And apparently this takes place about a half hour before the start of Fellowship of the Ring. So it kind of takes you out of it, you know. And then Frodo Baggins shows up also. And had this movie come out before The Lord of the Rings, obviously the scene wouldn't have been in there. And Peter Jackson does a pretty good job of putting in Lord of the Rings throwbacks into this movie without it feeling forced. But this was just not one of those times. I mean, it has this scene with Bilbo and Frodo. Bilbo's hinting that he's gonna leave soon. We know that from Fellowship. And then Frodo leaves. He's saying, oh, I'm gonna go surprise Gandalf when he gets here. Which is kind of unnecessary. It doesn't have to take place right before Fellowship of the Ring. Especially once after all three Hobbit movies come out and if people marathon these movies starting with The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey and then going through The Hobbit trilogy and then The Lord of the Rings trilogy. That scene is kind of weird to have in. Small gripe, but just saying. And then it cuts back 60 years earlier to the start of The Hobbit, and you see Gandalf and Bilbo, their first meeting. And in this movie, Bilbo is played by Martin Freeman. You might know him as Watson from the Sherlock series on BBC. And I thought he did a really good job as Bilbo. At the beginning of this movie, he's a total classic Hobbit, doesn't want anything to do with outside adventures. And you see also that once he joins the party, he's kind of bumbling around, he doesn't really know what he's doing, he doesn't even know how he went on the adventure. But it's cool seeing his character grow throughout this movie. And another cool scene is when he's at his house, and all the dwarves start coming in, because he doesn't know where any of them are coming from. And eventually Gandalf talks him into joining this adventure and now he's off with the dwarves. 13 of these dwarves to be exact. And that's another thing about this movie is that there's a lot of dwarves in this movie and you know the Fellowship had a lot of people too. But with the Fellowship they were able to give screen time for each individual character and so you cared about all of them. Even Boromir who was only alive for one movie he was really cool. In this movie, you have a couple big dwarves. I mean, you have Bilbo and Gandalf, the non-dwarves, and then you have Thorin, and then, like, Dwalin and Balin, and then most of the other dwarves are kind of disposable. Granted, Bilbo does still have some scenes with other dwarves, like Philly and Killy, and then there was one, the one that he's talking to when he's leaving the party, like, midway through before they get captured by the goblins. But they do still have a couple more movies to get involved with all the other dwarves, so I can let that slide. But while they're going through their adventure, you see some throwbacks to the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You see, you know, the troll scene and the Rivendell scene. Those iconic scenes that are in the Hobbit book, which I've read part of. And then that Peter Jackson was able to incorporate into the Lord of the Rings trilogy also. Now, the Hobbit is a pretty small book, though, and so they're splitting it into three movies, and in doing that, Peter Jackson is pulling from some other stuff that's not in The Hobbit. You know, he's putting in a whole story with the Necromancer, and in that, he put in a character called Radagast the Brown. Now, I've heard a lot of people's mixed feelings about Radagast the Brown. Some people like him, some people hate him. I actually didn't mind him that much in the movie. He's not in the movie as much as I heard that he was. And for what he was doing in the movie, I thought he was okay. He added some comedic relief to it. If this was the only Hobbit movie that we ever got, then I would say that he didn't really need to be in the movie. But his story does tie in a lot more with the Necromancer, so I'm really interested to see where they go with that in the next couple movies. Once the dwarves get to Rivendell, Gandalf also has a meeting with Saruman, which is kind of cool to see because Saruman is still good at this point. I like how they kept it mostly in the shadows because Christopher Lee is like 90 years old right now. Yeah, he wasn't really looking too pretty in this scene, but I'm glad that they had him in the movie. They did just release an extended version of this movie a couple months ago. I haven't seen it yet, but there are some scenes in this movie that you think, okay, you just put this in to drag out the runtime, didn't you? If The Hobbit was only going to be two movies like it was originally going to be, this scene probably would have been in the extended version. And of course the scene I'm talking about is when they're on the mountain and those two mountains are like kicking each other apart. It's a cool scene, but at the end of the day, besides of like one line that Thorin says at the end of the scene, did that really have to be in this movie? I don't really think it did, because all it really did was establish that Thorin doesn't like Bilbo, but we already knew that. So that's one of those scenes where I was like, okay, you can cut this because we know this. I mean... Let's, let's show me, show us something new, please. I feel like I'm bagging on this movie a lot, though, but I really do like this movie. I thought that after that mountain scene, the rest of the movie was, like, perfect. I mean, you see the goblin chase scene and all of that. You see Gandalf come up and just slice that goblin king's throat and the, the belly and the fat. And that was a cool scene, just watching the dwarves just escape and doing all their cool maneuvers and everything. And then while they're doing all that, you also have the riddles in the dark scene with Gollum, which was great. And Gollum looks really good in this movie, too. The CGI is definitely a lot better than it was in The Lord of the Rings. And it still holds up in The Lord of the Rings, so it's, like, really good here. 
I think the fact that Gollum was in the shadows for most of it helped it with the lighting and everything. But you can see the emotion on his face, like when Bilbo holds Sting up to his neck and you see him turn around and you see the tear trickle down. Yeah, it really helps you feel for the guy. You feel for a CGI little impish thing. That's why Peter Jackson and Andy Serkis are awesome. Another cool part of that scene is that in the Fellowship of the Ring when Gandalf and Frodo were talking in the Mines of Moria, now Frodo says it's a pity that Bilbo didn't kill Gollum when he had the chance. And Gandalf goes, Pity. It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Which is cool, because you see him, he has his sword down in his neck, and he even brings it up to do the slice, and then Gollum turns around. And then he stops his sword right there, and the Hobbit's theme starts playing, and you think back to that one line that Gandalf says to Bilbo earlier in the movie. True courage is knowing not when to take a life, but when to spare one. That whole scene was really well done, because you see that Gollum, he's kind of sad about the ring, but then once he escapes, Gollum reverts right back to his normal self, and that last scene you see of him totally sets his character up for the Lord of the Rings. You feel bad for a second, but then after that you're like, yeah, Bilbo, run. Dude sees you, he is going to murder you, so yeah, um, get back to Gandalf, dude. And the last big action scene of this movie was also really exciting when Thorin takes on Azog the Defiler. You know, he gets beat down, but then Bilbo comes in and saves him, and you see him just stabbing that one orc down. Which is a funny scene because it's like Bilbo's fighting style, and he doesn't really know what he's doing. You can tell the guy is definitely not a warrior, but he's doing this to protect his friend that he just met throughout this journey. Then after that, Thorin goes up and he hugs him, and they're kind of friends now. But in the end, if you have not seen The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, you definitely have to see it before Desolation of Smaug comes out. If you like the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I think you'll like The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. I even know some people that like The Hobbit more than Lord of the Rings, so I mean, maybe if you don't like Lord of the Rings, it's still worth checking out. I personally think it's a little inferior to the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I can't give it my best, but I'm still going to give The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey an A. It's a solid start to this trilogy, it got me interested, I want to see where they go with this trilogy, and I've heard that the Desolation of Smaug is pretty good, so I'm excited. So The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, what do you think about it, and do you think that Peter Jackson was right in splitting this movie into a trilogy? Whatever your thoughts are on that, comment down below, I want to know your thoughts, and thanks for watching this video, if you guys like it, you can click here to see more.